Yes, dear colleagues, uh, we should start this morning's seminar. Uh, the speaker today is Maria Cervedio, and I cannot tell how happy we are that you're here. Uh, Orian spoke yesterday, and actually Orian, Maria, and uh, Janet Bauman, uh, you are not the first scholars from the natural sciences to be fellows of the Collegium. We have had a number before, but you are the first little grouping that is funded through the program uh, for natural sciences here, which is generously supported by the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation and the family Erling Passion Foundation. Um, we are grateful for the funding and having scholars in residence uh, under normal rules for an Institute for Advanced Study is one important component. We hope that will be growing, but we are also constituting a series of networks around main themes. And we actually had a large symposium in this room, some 22 speakers who treated issues of biological systems analysis and biological networks and emergent topics in these fields. And it was very exciting. And so we but we are, I, I must say, I cannot say how happy I am that we have a group of scholars now in this field. And actually, uh, Janet and Maria are both, um, well, you collaborate, all three of you, but Janet and Maria have a joint proposal dealing with the condition, conditions and their, uh, for the speciation. Um, and I think you will touch upon some of those aspects in your talk. Maria was, had her undergraduate education at Harvard and her graduate training was at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, she has held positions at a number of, of universities, including Cornell, the University of California at San Diego, the University of California at Davis, a well-known uh, well university, not least in the biological field, of course. Both San Diego and, 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 uh, and Davis are, of course. And she has, she has a very strong orientation towards mathematics and building mathematical models, trying to explicate basic questions in evolution. So you could say that her research interest falls in the domain of theoretical biology and trying to model that, but address then substantial and very basic theoretical questions. Uh, she has published a lot. and. Those people who would count on impact would be very deeply impressed. We are deeply impressed. I cannot claim, of course, that I've read your work, but I've looked at your CV very carefully and I've glanced at some of the publications and it's, it's very impressive. Um, I will not enumerate all the journals in which Maria's work have been published, but maybe I'm allowed to say that as of last year, she is also the vice president of the American Society of Naturalists. Not surprisingly, she has been extremely successful in raising grants for her research. She has been the principal investigator for a long series of research projects funded by the National Science Foundation in the US. But we are enormously grateful that you're here and that we are in communication also over lunches and in daily, daily interactions. Only one. Thank you for the very kind introduction, and it's been fascinating to be here and talk to people that aren't biologists, which isn't a normal thing <laughs> for me to do. Um, so I'm very happy to be here, and uh, I'm sure so is Jenny. It's a lot of fun to work um, in this environment. Okay, so um, as was stated, I'm an evolutionary theoretician. Is the mic going? It's fading. It's okay? All right. Um, which means I use mathematical models to address questions in evolution. And I'm going to be talking about one of my three major areas of research today, which is the effects of sexual selection on the origin of species. So because I use mathematical models, and that's a less common approach, I'm actually going to spend some time talking about um, why we would use mathematical models, particularly the type of models that I use and how that's done. Then I'm going to touch on the two topics that you actually see in this title, so um, what I mean by sexual selection and what I mean by the origin of species. I'll go into depth on an example of a project where I ask this question about the effects of sexual selection on the origin of species. And then I want to touch on, or introduce you to rather, the project that Jenny and I are working on here at SCAS. Okay, so I should say I'm happy to be interrupted if anyone has any questions. I'd sort of rather you ask them than, um, if I'm going too fast, I'd rather be stopped and back up a little than just kind of keep plowing onward. <laughs> 
All right, so to start very basic, though, um, to explain uh, how I use models and the way they're used um, in evolutionary biology, I'm going to back up all the way to the scientific method, which my daughter assures me is taught in sixth grade, so you're all probably very familiar with, but I think it's a good place to start. So this is a very um, idealized version of the scientific method in practice. It's far, far messier than this, but I think it, again, will serve the purpose. So um, the scientific me method in general, as a, applied to biology, I should say, is to observe nature and build a hypothesis that you want to address. You then gather evidence, you analyze the evidence. It's a little hard to read this, I can see, but it, this says evaluate hypothesis and propose new directions. And what we mean here is either you can tell um, from the evidence that you've gathered and from your analysis that the hypothesis is false, in which case you would go back and tweak it, or change it, come up with a new hypothesis. Or you could tell that it's supported, in which case you may want to go back and develop further questions or follow up questions to the hypothesis that you've, you've shown um, there's some good evidence for. So there's a few different approaches, and I'm only going to touch on two major avenues of approaches you could use to actually do this. So one is an empirical approach, and here you're really using data. So you would design a protocol and gather data. This might be for an experiment, or this might be for gathering observations in a very systematic way to evaluate your hypothesis. You would then analyze the data, and you would go on again to evaluate your hypothesis and propose new directions. So your data is all gathered from the natural world or from experiments um, using actual organisms. Um, what I use is a very analogous approach that I call proof of concept models. So a proof of concept model is analyzing a hypothesis, but it's basically seeing whether the hypothesis is logically sound. So in order to do this, you would not really look at data. Instead, you would pick assumptions and build a mathematical model. You would then analyze the model using a variety of tools, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by this in a minute. And you would then, again, evaluate whether your hypothesis seems to be supported. So it's a form of hypothesis test, but what you're really testing is a verbal like, chain of logic that constitutes a complicated evolutionary hypothesis. Um, I should say these hypotheses in evolution can actually get quite complicated. The phenomena you're trying to explain are often complicated, and you're, you have arguments where you think maybe this is happening, and then maybe this is happening, and this leads to this, and this leads to this. And so it's very easy to make mistakes in these chains of logic, these verbal models or verbal chains of logic. Um, it's very easy to make assumptions you don't realize that you're making. And when you lay it out mathematically, you formalize all of this in a way that makes it um, very obvious if you're making a specific assumption, and the math leads you from step to step in your verbal chain of logic in a way that's very rigorous. So I'm going to give you an example of what I mean, because I know this may sound all a little abstract. I should say these kinds of models are very abstract. So one long-standing question in evolutionary biology is why we have sexual reproduction. So um, there's many reasons why sexual reproduction might be costly. First of all, you have to find a mate. Um, you have to, finding a mate actually is very costly in and of itself. You have to search for a mate. You have to maybe expose yourself to predators when you're out there looking for a mate. Um, if you're displaying to find a mate, you're making yourself very obvious to predators. You're saying, hey, here I am, <laughs> come eat me. Um, so that's one reason it's very costly. Um, you can contract a sexually transmitted disease if you're mating sexually. Uh, if you're mating asexually, it's much more efficient. Every individual in the population can produce offspring. If you're mating sexually, you need a male and a female to produce a single offspring, even. So there's something called the twofold cost of sex, which means that you need males, which can't actually physically produce the offspring, only one sex is. So there's a bunch of reasons sexual reproduction should actually be selected against in a population. And yet, we see it very commonly. So this is something that people have tried to explain of a bunch of different ways. And here's one hypothesis that people have come up with. It's that sexual reproduction can be more effective in purging a population of deleterious mutations, you know, meaning harmful mutations, mutations harmful for survival or reproduction. So um, let me illustrate that with a couple of pictures. So let's say we're talking about, um, for the sake of argument, something that's haploid, so has a single copy of each chromosome, not two copies the way humans do. So we're looking at two different organisms here, two different individuals. Um, maybe this is one of their chromosomes, so chromosome number one, okay? Uh, this individual has a deleterious mutation shown in red at a certain position in the chromosome. 
And this one has a deleterious mutation shown in blue at a different position, in which mutations are happening randomly all the time in different spots in the chromosome. So this is very likely you'd have different deleterious mutations. If these individuals are asexual, um, every offspring that this individual has is going to carry this red mutation onward. Um, eventually, the daughters in this lineage are going to pick up new deleterious mutations. So you're just going to accumulate deleterious mutations. The odds of ever getting rid of this red mutation are very slim. You'd have to have what's called a back mutation, back to your original amino acid at that very specific position. Since mutation rates are low, that's really unlikely. By the time you did that, you'd probably accumulate other deleterious mutations. So you expect populations to just accumulate bad junk on their DNA um, if they're asexual. So the idea is, well, maybe if you have sexual reproduction, your red and blue individual could cross, and that then allows for a process called recombination, where you have crossing over of different arms of chromosomes, and you can swap genetic material between them. So if we were to unravel these chromosomes that have crossed over, you can see that we now have the red and blue deleterious mutations on the same individual, and here we've reconstituted an individual with no deleterious mutations. So on a population-wide level, we can um, continually reconstitute classes of individuals that have less and less deleterious mutations, and the population may be much healthier and more likely to survive, for example, changes in climate, um, bottlenecks, other changes that might um, make it difficult for individuals in that population to survive. Okay, so this is a verbal model, verbal chain of logic. It sounds good, but does it always work? Are there only certain conditions where it works, certain rates of mutation, certain rates of recombination, certain strengths of selection against deleterious mutations, certain population sizes? How broad are these conditions? Do these benefits actually outweigh those costs of sexual reproduction that I mentioned before? So we can create a mathematical model to figure out all of these questions, to figure out how likely this is to really explain whether sexual reproduction um, would evolve due to this, hypo this particular hypothesis. And people have, hypothesis, and people have um, generated many mathematical models to explain many different hypotheses for the evolution of sexual reproduction. Okay, so that's an example of this type of model that I'm calling proof of concept models. Um, they are very abstract models, really reducing things down to their essence when you're making these types of models, but they have to be grounded in reality. So there's two places that um, observations or uh, basically connections to the natural world come in. That's first at the assumption stage, so your assumptions have to be realistic to a point. There are certain assumptions that we can violate from reality and we kind of know the effects that those have, um, but other assumptions have to really be grounded in, in reality, and we get a sense for which assumptions we can make that are less realistic and which ones we can't. Um, if you have a model that's completely ungrounded in reality, it's, it's kind of pointless. It was just a fun, maybe, but it's not really explaining anything. The other place that the models have to link to the natural world is in the predictions that they generate. You could then go and test those using experiments or observations. So it's sort of a two-way street. Okay, so um, how do we build these mathematical models? Because uh, this is very vague at this point. So there are different types of mathematical models. They all have their pluses and minuses. Um, I did want to say, sorry, I'm going to back up a second. I did want to say that this type of model, the proof of concept models that I'm using here, they're, they're pretty different than the mo types of models that Orion was talking about last week. So the models he was speaking about were statistical models or more descriptive models. There are many descriptive models that are used in biology. You would use them, for example, if you're explaining, well, even chemistry, enzyme kinetic pathways. If you're trying to describe a physiological process, you would try to very carefully match your model to what you're actually seeing in data. That's not really what we're doing here. This is, again, really logical models testing um, chains of logic. So it's a little bit different. OK, so the kinds of models that I use are called population genetic models. And these um, assume that traits are discrete. So you can, um, you can also look at other types of models that are specifically um, formulated for continuous traits, like height. Discrete traits, again, would be something like maybe eye color. Um, the way we uh, develop these models is uh, we have variables that are genotype frequencies. So what we're doing is we're trying to see whether certain genotypes, so this would be 
you know, either at a single locus or across several loci, but a discrete number of loci, so a small number, you know, maybe two to six. Um, whether our variables, which are our genotype frequencies, uh, change over time in a way that your genotype would spread throughout the population and would be maintained evolutionarily, or whether certain genotypes would be lost in the population. So those are our variables that we're tracking the change of over time. And the parameters um, in the model are evolutionary forces. And so these are what are called um, the forces of microevolution. So they're causing changes in genotype frequencies over time. And the equations for these are very basic and very well known and well established. So these forces would be natural selection, which would be um, differences in viability or survival or, um, or reproductive rate between different individuals, sexual selection, which I'll talk about more um, in a few minutes, mutation, which can occur at certain rates, migration in and out of populations, which occur at certain rates, and genetic drift, which I'm not going to talk about today, and you model slightly differently, but that would just be the role of chance or sampling in evolution. So um, you have your variables, you have your parameters, you write sets of equations, which are called difference equations. So these equations describe how in one generation, each of your genotype frequencies would change in time um, based on those parameters that I've talked about. And then to analyze these models, you either solve them analytically or simulate them or both. And what you're looking at, what you're looking for rather, is equilibria. So what, will your, what frequencies will your genotypes eventually reach? Um, will they be fixed? Will they be lost? Will they reach some intermediate frequency and just stay there over long periods of time? Um, you're looking also for the stability of those equilibrium points. So are you moving towards them or away from them over long periods of time, over many generations? And sometimes you're also looking at dynamics. So how rapidly are you approaching them? Do you cycle around your, your equilibrium points? Um, how does that happen? Okay, so what question am I trying to address using all of these techniques? What's so complicated that I need to explain it using um, this type of model? So this was my title, and I'm going to turn this into a question. So the question really is, what are the effects of sexual selection on the origin of species? So um, there's a little bit of jargon here, so I'm going to first talk about what I mean by the origin of species, um, and then what I mean by sexual selection. So to start with the origin of species. So the or by the origin of species, I really mean um, the process of speciation, which is the splitting of one species into two distinct species that no longer can exchange genes with one another. So um, we actually have a lot to explain because there are a lot of species out there. So um, I have some numbers that I threw around in the abstract that I sent out. Uh, we can only estimate how many species are undescribed in nature, and the estimates vary by a couple of orders of magnitude. So some, I've seen between 40,000, uh, sorry, um, 40 million and like a trillion is estimate some of the numbers of species out there. I don't think we'll ever know. Um, if you look at described species, um, this was a chart made in 1992 and I've updated the numbers um, to uh, ones from 2009. Um, at that point, there were about 1.9 million described species, which is a lot. Um, a lot of these are sexually reproducing, meaning that um, sister pairs, like very closely related pairs of species, could potentially be capable of exchanging genes because they can reproduce sexually. You can see that there's a lot of insects in here. Um, other animals are just a, a fraction, small fraction of this, this pie chart. If we zoom in on animals altogether, which is insects and other animals, um, we can still see, well, here's the insects again, broken up a little bit more. A lot of species, here's mammals, the, the ones we're maybe more familiar with if you ask a kid, name an animal, right? They're gonna name a mammal, which is only a teeny tiny fraction of the animals that are out there. Or birds, amphibians, reptiles, things like that are in other chordates, which is this piece over there. Anyway, almost all of these um, that I'm showing here are sexually reproducing. There's some that aren't, um, but it's a small fraction. So again, there's a lot to explain in terms of how, does, how do these branch out to form so many species. So there's one way that this can happen that seems kind of easy, or easy to explain. So I'm gonna show a few graphs that look like this. Um, this is time going downward. So this is like an ancestral population a long time ago and then we're going forward in time coming down here. So there's um, 
whether or not speciation occurs easily or more difficult, or is more difficult to explain, depends on uh, the geography of how it occurs to some extent. So there's, uh, this is called allopatric speciation, what's described here. So if you take a population and you split it into two isolated species, so this is supposed to be a barrier, maybe a river between two land masses, or maybe these are two islands that are far away, or maybe it's um, two parts of a range that are separated by a mountain range and the, the organisms can't cross. Um, if you have that sort of barrier, you can have just independent evolution of each lineage on either side of the barrier, and they can just start to diverge from one another, because this could be a very, very long period of time, maybe millions of years, until the point that if they were to come in con into contact, and they don't have to come into contact, but if they were, maybe they would not be able to reproduce. So you would say then that they'd evolved reproductive incompatibilities. And um, because these are important for the rest of the talk, I'm going to just spend a minute on them. So it could be that they choose not to interbreed. They just don't recognize each other as something that you might possibly want to mate with. They could try to interbreed, but fertilization couldn't occur. So maybe um, egg proteins and sperm, sorry, sperm proteins and egg receptors just don't work anymore. They don't match well enough to um, produce a, a fertilized zygote. Or they could potentially produce hybrids, but these could be inviable or sterile, so they could not survive. Or they could survive, but like a, a mule, for example, which is a cross between a horse and a donkey, they could just not be fertile. In that case, they can't back cross, so the genes can't really get all the way across into inter be, to be intermixed in the other population. Okay, so you can evolve all of these reproductive incompatibilities. And in allopatry, it's sort of easy to imagine how that could occur. You just give it enough time, and all of a sudden, things don't work anymore. Um, it's much harder in a couple of other scenarios, and these are the ones that theoreticians are much more interested in because it's a hard problem, and we get to have some fun and do some math. So um, these are parapatry and sympatry, these ones that are diagrammed here. So in parapatry, we're imagining that we have a very, very big range, maybe. So if you could think of all of Eurasia, perhaps. And you just start to get differentiation in different edges of the range by chance. And by the time individuals finally sort of, you know, their grand offspring or great-great-grand offspring finally make it into contact, they can no longer interbreed. Now, again, this sounds maybe like it would work, but you really would need to build a model to sort of see if this is feasible. Um, this scenario is even harder, so this is sympatry. Here we're imagining we have one range, and just within it, somehow magically individuals, I say magically because it's really actually hard to get this work in a model, individuals are somehow differentiating, so you get two different types. So you could also, um, sorry, I should say these two categories in general, we can put under the heading of speciation with gene flow. So gene flow meaning that we can, throughout the um, process, hypothetically have genes going from one population into another. Um, you could also draw a picture looking a lot like the allopatry one where you allow gene flow. And so that's if you have um, ranges that are fairly separate, but you get occasional migrants going back and forth. Um, you could even extend this a little bit further to assume that there's allopatry for a while, and then you have contact, but by migration, you introduce migration. But when you introduce migration, they are still capable of interbreeding. They haven't sort of finished speciating. What happens then? So all of these are different scenarios of speciation with gene flow. This one's hardest to imagine how it would work. This one's easiest, just because you have spatial separation for a while. So um, the reason gene flow is so interesting, I just want to go into that a little bit more, is because of this. Um, problem that it poses in terms of uh, how would you ever get complete separation, or how would you ever get even separation starting. So imagine that you have a single population, and there's a phenotype that's maybe very ecologically important. So we could imagine something like bill size in a bird that lets you eat certain seeds if your bill is the right size to process them. So um, as Orian was talking about last week, most phenotypes are normally distributed in, um, in nature. So imagine we have initially just one population with a phenotype that's normally distributed. Now, if you apply what's called disruptive selection, what that means is that we're imagining that the ends of this distribution are surviving much better than the middle of the distribution. So maybe you have only two types of seeds in the environment, very small and very large. And if you have very small bills, you can process the small seeds well. But if you have large bills, you can process the large seeds well. So right after like a, a season, You'd imagine that maybe 
your distribution might look something like this. So your small build individuals survived pretty well, your large build in individuals survived pretty well, and the ones in the middle didn't. Okay, now the problem with gene flow um, is this. So let's say we had random mating. So individuals that are small build were just as likely to mate with individuals that are large build as to mate kind of within their own half of the distribution. You could get a lot of matings across. What would happen after mating occurred is that the offspring in the next generation, right before selection, would again be normally distributed. And there might be a wider variance, but um, you expect to kind of reconstitute a normal distribution because your genes are shuffling. Everybody's shuffling at the reproduction stage. So even if you're applying the strong selection, or pulling the population apart, um, you're losing all of that ground towards separating into two species as soon as you have random mating. So the way around that is to have um, what we call assortative mating. So assortative mating would be like mating with like. And in that case, you can imagine that your small build individuals maybe would prefer to mate with other small build individuals, and your large build individuals would prefer to mate with large build individuals, and then maybe you could keep this bimodal distribution. And if you kept applying disruptive selection and you still had a sort of mating, eventually maybe they would separate to the point that they're not overlapping anymore. Okay, so that's, that's a hypothetically how you could get speciation occurring with gene flow. And I should say that we're not really necessarily concerned as speciation biologists with um, complete reproductive isolation. So there's lots of things that we call species that aren't completely reproductively isolated. So for example, grizzly, grizzly, what we call grizzly bears, but our brown bears and polar bears um, actually can produce hybrids. Apparently they're very um, tempting to hunt. Uh, there's, there's evidence of introgression sort of back into um, brown bears, I think it is. I can't forget the directionality um, from hybridization between brown bears and polar bears. And they've also shown in zoos that hybrids between these are fertile. Um, these are green-winged teal, mallards, and black ducks, and they hybridize extensively. So this is a hybrid mallard and black duck. This is a hybrid green-winged teal and mallard. Um, even though there's extensive hybridization throughout the range of these, we're still going to call them separate species. It's just too difficult to do taxonomy if we, taxonomy if we were going to rule out any possibility of producing a viable and fertile hybrid every time we wanted to name something. OK, so we're really just concerned with sort of getting a lot of differentiation and getting gene flow reduced a lot, but we're not concerned with getting it all the way to zero. Okay, so um, I've talked about the origin of species and what I mean by that and what's interesting about it theoretically. Now I wanna talk a little bit about what I mean by sexual selection. So sexual selection is defined as the change in the frequency of a trait due to differential reproductive success. So some traits, are going to be um, associated with higher reproductive rates than other traits because of the ability to find a mate or um, you know, acquire a mate that produces, acquire a healthy, vigorous mate um, if you have that trait. So again, we sort of have a lot to explain here. Um, there's really amazing traits that exist out there that are attributed to sexual selection. So a lot of these are visual, which is um, they're amazing to show on a slide because they are visual, right? So peacocks, train, um, frigate birds. Um, some of these are auditory, so frog calls. Um, pheromones are also sexually selected, so mammals, um, a lot of it is scent. Um, you can have sexually selected traits in both males and females together, like in these crested auklets. In this blue crab, it's the females that are showing the blue um, coloration, so it can go both ways, but most commonly it's females that are the kind of plain drab ones, perhaps, that are choosing males, and the males are the elaborate ones. So the reason is that um, females are usually less available to mate than males at any given time. They're putting more effort or offspring into every single offspring that they have, um, whether it's effort, um, resources into an egg or whether it's a pregnancy and just not being available to mate because the organism is already pregnant. So um, because of this, males generally compete um, to be chosen by females. So I'm going to talk more about how this works exactly in a little bit. 
Um, but why do people think that sexual selection has any relationship to the process of speciation? So it's sort of a hypothesis that's pretty old that they're related. And the reason is that you often see males that differ strikingly in their coloration or other um, sexual ornaments that are very closely related. So these are cichlids from Lake Victoria. These are all in one single lake that's actually rather young. And the males differ strikingly in their coloration and patterning. And it's known that assorted mating is very important in keeping these species apart. Um, you see this over and over. There's many, many cases of closely related species where the males at least look quite different. So hummingbirds in um, the Americas, this, these, are, uh, these are not all St. Patrick's, so they wouldn't all be sitting on a single branch like this. But this just shows you some of the differences in plumage. You can see there's a lot of ornamentation, and they're very different from one another. These are Hawaiian honey creepers, so these are living a little bit closer together. And this slide is usually shown, um, I think it was, I got it from a, a textbook, um, because the bill shape is actually an obvious ecological character that would be um, differentiating. So these guys, you can imagine, are eating something very different, probably seeds, than these ones, which are probably eating nectar. Um, but they also differ a lot in color. So right? color is not really going to help ecologically with what they're eating. It's going to be sexually selected. So a hypothesis that you see over and over again in the literature is that sexual selection promotes speciation. So they're seeing these differences. Um, empiricists and even theoreticians are seeing these differences in um, coloration between closely related things or in ornamentation between closely related things. And they're hypothesizing a direction of causality, that the sexual selection is driving the speciation process. OK, so that's a question I'm going to really address here. Um, does sexual selection promote speciation? So um, as we jump into this question, I just want to remind you, I already talked about mate choice to some extent when I talked about assorted mating. So I said that we need assorted mating, like mating with like, in order to um, keep, for example, bimodality here. In this example, where we're looking at speciation of a single population into two. Um, but assorted mating, it's important to realize, is different than sexual selection. So with assorted mating, again, we can define that as like mating with like. If you imagine that you have um, a bunch of females and uh, the same number of males, and the females each have a preference that would lead them to choose a different male, there can be mate choice. But, and there could be like mating with like, maybe like small build will mate with small build. But if everybody likes someone that's exactly like them, it's possible to not have any sexual selection in terms of not having any differential mating success. It could be that every male gets a female, everyone has equal mating success, but you did have a sorted of mating because they were matching um, each other. Females were matching um, their own appearance and their preferences. Does that make sense? Hopefully. OK, so I'm going to look at this question about how sexual selection could prom whether sexual selection promotes speciation um, using actually this one to the far left here. I'm basically trying to make it as easy as possible to get speciation um, in this scenario uh, to, make, to basically address this question in a conservative way. So here I'm assuming that there's initially differentiation that's occurring in allopatry, introducing migration, and seeing what sexual selection in particular does. So let me talk a little bit about how you might get differentiation of traits due to sexual selection in allopatry. So what people are imagining when they're saying sexual selection is promoting speciation is they're often imagining something like this. So imagine that we have two populations with a geographic barrier, so there's no gene flow between these. Um, the purple ones are males. And the white ones are females. I'm showing that they don't have the trait. The trait would be color here. So what people are imagining is happening is that in one population, individuals are getting a little bit redder, and females are developing a preference for red, for example. And in the other population, males are maybe getting a little bit bluer, and females are getting a preference for blue. And that's going on and on each generation until we have um, really red males and a preference for red here, and really blue males and a preference for blue here. So how does this happen within one population? I'm going to jump into an explanation for that, because it's actually really important for understanding um, the rest of what I'm going to be talking about. So this is a, a diagram that stems from, from mathematical models built by Russ Landy and Mark Kirkpatrick in the early 80s. Um, what we have in this chart is a trait 
on the y-axis. You can imagine redder is up and less red is down here. And we have a preference for redder males on the x-axis where a very strong um, preference for like, very red males would be over here. And a preference, or like no preference, maybe a preference for, actually let's just say no preference is over here. So this dashed line here would be when females have a preference for males that are um, the exact same as the males that are actually present in the population. So you can imagine this, um, a dot in this space would be a whole population. So if the dot's on the line, the, the males in the population have the trait that is preferred by females, okay? So in this dot that I've thrown on here, females in general have a preference for males that are redder than the males that are actually around, okay? because we're below this line, so the males are only this red, but the preference would be for males that are like up here, right there. Okay, so um, because females prefer males that are, are redder than your average male in the population, what's gonna happen is um, we're selecting for redder and redder traits, so we'd imagine this dot to move upward in a single generation, right? Because it's selection, sexual selection is causing the males that are redder to survive better, so the line should go up. Now the thing is, if you're a, a red male, a pretty red male, um, odds are you're gonna have a better chance of mating with a female with a strong preference for red than if you're not a very red male. So um, your offspring are gonna be likely to inherit both your red color and a strong preference for red because it's likely that their mother had a strong preference for red. So you end up developing what's called a statistical association or genetic association between the preference for red males and redness itself because of this non-random mating. Again, um, you're more likely to have uh, a mother that has a preference for red if your father is very red, right? Because that's what the preference does, it causes non-random mating. So that, um, fact that you are likely to have had mothers with a preference for red if you're these redder, more successful males is going to move the population not only up but over through what's called indirect selection. So um, you, have, you ended up having movement over in the preference direction of this graph not because preferences helped you survive better or have more offspring, but just because the males that were successful tended to carry those preference alleles for stronger preferences for red. So um, because you move up and over, you actually end up at a place on a line of equilibrium that's drawn here that actually has um, very strong red coloration and has a much stronger preference for red than was initially present in the population. And this preference is evolving only due to the presence of this indirect selection, this statistical association that developed between color and preference. So if you were to magically go in that population and somehow remove that statistical association, you would have just gotten this population moving only um, upward, not horizontally at all, and you would have ended up on this line of equilibrium at a much lower point, so males would not have been as red, and your preference wouldn't have evolved at all. Your preference would have just stayed where it was when you started. So um, this is actually really important uh, in order to understand the rest of the talk, so I'm gonna dive into it a little bit more, this distinction between direct selection and indirect selection, and this, this fact that preferences are evolving only due to indirect selection. So to back up, um, you can define direct selection as a frequency of an allele changing, changing due to the fact that selection directly favors it. So you survive better if you have this allele, okay? The allele that's directly under selection. If we had, for example, a locus for color, again, where we have a red allele and a blue allele, and we had selection for red, meaning you survived better if you had red, um, red would increase, okay? This direct selection, very simple. Indirect selection, though, is when the frequency of an allele changes because it's genetically or statistically associated with another allele at a different locus that's under selection. So to make that concrete, imagine we have two loci now, one for color, where we have red and blue, and one for height, where we have tall and short. If we have no correlation and we have um, selection so that reds survive better, um, red will increase, 
And we'll have no change at all at the height because height's completely randomly associated with color. If, though, we had a correlation, so red individuals tended to be tall, then when we select for red, red survives better, red will increase and the genes for tall height will also increase. So your population's gotten taller even though you didn't directly select for height. It's just because you had a statistical association between height and being red. Now, the important point here um, is not only that this is indirect in this example, but actually you don't expect your population to get as tall as it did red. And the reason is um, we're assuming that these are statistically associated, but this, they're probably not perfectly statistically associated. There's probably some slop there. Maybe if you're red, you tend to be tall, but it's not that every individual that's red is tall and every individual that's blue is short. So because it's just a statistical association and it's a little bit sloppy, height will increase, but it's not going to increase as much as red color did. Okay, so indirect selection is generally acknowledged to be weaker than direct selection because it depends on the strength of the statistical association. And in biology, you never have a, you know, things that are 100% associated or it's really, really rare. Okay, um, so this is why our preference evolved over to the right, but it didn't evolve over um, as far as our trait evolved upwards. Our preference evolved due to indirect selection, and I've actually shown it quite strong here, quite a big movement over to the right. But um, this force moving the preference is going to be weaker than the force moving the trait upward. But again, the preference is only evolving because of this force. There's no other um, evolutionary force affecting the preference here. Okay, so we've imagined that this process has occurred in our two populations, so that's why we have red and preference for red here, and we have blue and preference for blue here. So a question is, what happens if there's gene flow? Can um, this process really lead to um, the maintenance of differentiation? Will this be a permanent change? What will happen? So to, to look at this, um, we're going to introduce migration between these two. Um, this is, again, that scenario where we're sort of maintaining a difference in our geography. We have two populations, but we've allowed migration between them. And this is a project that was done in collaboration with Reinhard Berger at the University of Vienna. So the assumptions in this model that I did to analyze this, it's a population genetic model, is I'm assuming this structure, first of all, you call this a two-island model. So we're analyzing each population separately, and they're connected by migration. I'm assuming there are two haploid models, two haploid loci. So we're really reducing this problem to its very basics. One locus is for the trait, where we have T1, which is um, a red, the locus, that, uh, sorry, allele that codes for red coloration, and T2 is the allele that codes for blue coloration. We're going to track the frequencies of all these alleles. The second locus is for preference, where PR is preference for red, and PB is preference for blue. And remember, females are carrying the trait color alleles, and males are carrying the preference alleles, or just not expressing them. So I'm first going to assume that there's an established female preference of a certain strength that I'm calling alpha. Sorry, more vocabulary here. Under a mating system called polygyny, that just means that every female gets a mate. It's kind of the most common mating system. Females, again, are the limiting resource. All females are, are maybe have equal reproductive success in the most extreme version, but males can differ a lot in their reproductive success. So what alpha is, is just the strength of preference, and um, it's parameterized so that if alpha was two, for example, um, females would be twice as likely to mate with a male that they prefer than a male that they didn't if they had a choice between the two males. So an alpha of zero would be they're equally likely to mate with both. Sorry, yeah, the way I did it, it would be an alpha of one would be twice as likely. Um, it's one plus one. Um, so higher alpha is, and more likely they are to make with the, mate with the male that they prefer. And we can ask two questions to get at the role of sexual selection. Um, what we're really interested in is alpha. So first of all, what happens to trait and preference divergence as you go from a very low alpha to a very high alpha? High alpha would be stronger sexual selection. Alpha of zero would be no sexual selection. And the second thing we want to look at is actually evolution of alpha itself. So this will tell us, because it will give us a fairly big picture about what sexual selection is doing in this scenario. So first we're going to look at trait and preference divergence, and first I'm going to um, kind of lead you down a blind alley. It turns out that if we just 
have these assumptions where we have differentiation initially and we allow migration and we analyze this model with only the assumptions that you see here, we actually can't maintain any differentiation between these populations, no matter how strong your alpha is. So um, sexual selection by itself actually cannot maintain differentiation, even in this case, which is um, not as hard as sympatry. We haven't tried to make these two things evolve in one population. We haven't tried to do this with continual migration between these islands. We've allowed the islands to get all the way separated before we allowed any migration. So it's kind of the easiest case to let sexual selection maintain differentiation. Then after they're completely differentiated, we've allowed migration and we still actually can't get sexual selection maintaining any differences between these populations. What happens is they sort of homogenize, so every island is half red, half blue, and then there's a little bit of numerical error that causes the whole system to sweep to blue and preference for blue, or the whole system to sweep to red and preference for red. We can't keep both of those around. Okay, so that's maybe a little bit surprising in and of itself. Um, but in order to ask further questions about um, the role of alpha and the, what sexual selection is actually doing, we're gonna um, make this a little easier to maintain differentiation by assuming that these traits are actually locally adapted. And what I mean by that is that maybe red makes males survive better in island one and blue makes males survive better in island two. So here we're actually putting viability selection on that trait locus. So females are now preferring locally adapted males in each population and we're seeing whether, what sexual selection is doing when we can maintain differentiation, which we know we can do even with random mating and local adaptation on the traits with, with this um, sort of two island setup. Okay, so adding this assumption then, we're going to go back to asking how is trait and preference divergence affected by your strength of sexual selection, which would be your alpha, strength of preference? And um, what would happen if you let that evolve? So first of all, we now can maintain divergence, which is good. Um, so knowing that, what we're asking really is what happens to trait and preference divergence when preferences get stronger? Okay, so alpha of zero would be random mating. Stronger and stronger alpha, higher and higher alpha would be stronger and stronger preferences. So I kind of, I'd like to actually stop and think about this for a second. Do you think with stronger preferences it would be easier to maintain divergence or harder? See if you're awake. I see some puzzled expressions which hopefully means you're thinking. You expect it would be easier. Yeah, so I quizzed a bunch of empiricist friends of mine who work on this problem and they all said easier. I thought easier. I quizzed a couple of theoreticians who all thought easier. So it seems logical that it would be easier with stronger preferences to maintain differentiation. So what you actually find is this. So to walk you through these graphs, um, what we're doing here is we're looking at population two only. The x-axis on each of these is strength of preference, so zero would be no preference, and 100 is really very high preferences. Um, this is the frequency of the blue trait, T2, in population two. This is the frequency of PB, I'm kind of, sorry, change notation on you here, or P2 in population two. And each of these lines is for a different strength of selection. So S is what's called a selection coefficient. It's just how advantageous it is to have the locally adapted trait. So um, 0.9 would be the, the most advantageous. It's the strongest selection favoring blue in population two. And one is, uh, point 0.1 is fairly weak selection, or moderate to weak selection favoring blue in population two. And what you can see is when we have, let's focus on this trait first. When we have um, random mating, we end up with the highest amount of the frequency of trait two, the blue trait in population two. And as we had stronger and stronger preferences, the frequency of the locally adapted blue trait actually goes down and down and down. And this is gonna asymptote um, at a preference strength of infinity at 0.5. So no differentiation between um, the frequency of red and the frequency of blue in population two. The preference does something similar. You can see this axis is actually only goes up to about 0.6, so it only comes up to what would be about here on this graph. Um, it peaks, and I could, if anyone's really interested, I could explain why it kind of does this little peak at the beginning later. Um, and then it kind of goes down. Similarly, it would compress at uh, 0.5 at an infinitely strong preference. So um, what we're seeing here is that increasingly strong sexual selection seems to prevent the maintenance of population differentiation. So exactly the opposite of what everyone I asked, including me, 
um, thought would happen. So why does this happen? Yeah, yes. I know, I'm sorry. This is the, yes, it's a mat it, these are the results of the mathematical model so built by those assumptions in the previous slide. So now, now I understand better. I want to yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we're finding, the result, is that it's exactly the opposite of what we thought would happen. Yeah, but I guess what happened? No, no, no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no. There's, um, because we're assuming discrete traits, we know mathematically exactly how selection would affect the frequency of an allele um, with Mendelian inheritance, which would be discrete traits, in one generation. So we have an exact mathematical equation for that. We also have exact mathematical equations for how frequencies would change by migration. So we add all those together in a way that makes sense in a logical, in a logical step. The little pieces are certain already. The natural selection step, the migration step. That's the nice thing about population genetics, is we know that the pieces are right. We, there may be assumptions there that are unrealistic, that are like, you know, we're assuming an infinite population size with no genetic drift, but we kind of know what that does. Um, you know, we, that would add slop, and we know the sort of slop that would add. Um, so when you put those pieces together, you're build, basically, that's when you're building those equations, which I'm not showing you because they're big, messy, systems of things that you don't want to see. Um, but when we analyze them, we're finding like these are equilibria for each of these alphas. And we know that they're stable. We actually simulate down to them. We can show analytically that they're stable. So this, this is like the end point of what we would see. Yeah, good question. You're not supposed to understand why yet, because I'm going to get to that in one second, why, this is, why we get this weird counterintuitive result. Yes, no, thank you for stopping me, because I don't want to plow on if people are confused. Um, OK, so this is why we get this weird counterintuitive result. I'm going to try to explain it now. So, and we can figure this out by actually diving into the model and looking at different steps in the life cycle and, and kind of showing that this is why we get this result. So I'm kind of sparing you the details of this, too. I'm just explaining what we found. So um, we're going to go back to here, uh, the point where we first introduced migration between these two things that are already differentiated. So as soon as you introduce migration, you get some of the red individuals and the females with the preference for red moving over here and vice versa. So we have variation in both populations. And that means that as soon as um, females choose their mates non-randomly, we get some of this genetic association or statistical association between blue and preference for blue and between red and preference for red. You call that linkage equilibrium. I probably shouldn't have thrown that up there because I don't think I'm going to use it again. But you get this the genetic association or statistical association established. So that plays a really important role. And we're going to look at what that's doing um, by tracing what's happening in population two again. So every generation, the frequency of blue individuals in population two goes down because red individuals move over. OK? Um, the frequency of blue, however, goes up because blue is locally adapted, improves, it improves survival. And more individuals, more females, are PB than PRET than PR. So sexual selection and viability selection both increase the frequency of blue. So we end up with that balancing out at a fairly high frequency of blue, which was our T2, in population 2. It's just a balance between migration and selection. Now, let's look at what happens to PB. So here, uh, migration is going to lower PB every generation because PR females move in. And um, PB is going to increase, but it's going to increase because of indirect selection. So PB does not affect the chances of a female to survive or reproduce. It is, though, um, statistically associated with the blue color that's increasing because of viability and sexual selection. So PB is going to increase as blue increases. But again, this statistical association isn't perfect. So it's not going to increase as high as blue does because of selection. Because it doesn't increase quite as high, it can't counter migration as well. 
So we end up getting very little preference divergence. We have a weak force raising it and migration lowering it versus a strong force favoring it for blue while migration's lowering it. So we end up getting very little preference divergence because we just have this weak force bringing the preference back up. Now, because we have very little preference divergence, sexual selection does weird things. So um, to figure out what it's doing, um, we're actually going to jump into the life cycle and look at what's going on right after local adaptation, so right after a season maybe of selection, where predators are eating fish based on color. Um, and right after local adaptation happens, we have a really high frequency of blue because a whole bunch of the red ones maybe just got eaten, okay? Um, meanwhile, our frequency of preferences aren't that different from one another. And this is actually numbers lifted from one particular simulation run. So our preferences, for the reasons I just explained, you know, they're only increasing because of indirect selection. Um, the preferences for blue might be just a little bit higher than the preferences for red. If you remember that graph with the preference axis, it was pretty compressed. The axis only went up to 0.6. You never have that much preference differentiation. So your preferences might look like this, while your traits look like this. And the really important thing is that it's these preferences that are applying sexual selection to these traits. So first imagine that we have very, very weak sexual selection. So preferences are almost doing nothing. We practically have random mating. If you then look at who's mating successfully among the males, so we're looking at successful matings by male type, it's going to mirror the frequencies after local adaptation. If we practically have random mating, whether or not you mate successfully is just going to be dependent on your frequency if you're a male. Okay? Sexual selection is not doing anything with very weak sexual selection. But if you have really, really strong sexual selection so that every female is not going to mate unless she finds a male that she likes, then the successful matings by male type are actually going to mirror the preference frequencies, not the trait frequencies. So what happens is when you have preferences that are very close together in frequency and you have strong sexual selection, that actually ends up erasing the gains that blue made by local adaptation here. So sexual selection is acting kind of against local adaptation in this scenario. So, and it's all due to the fact that these preferences are pretty homogenized between populations, they're pretty close in frequency. And again, that's due to the fact that they can't increase very much because they're only under indirect selection. So the fact that we have very little preference divergence is causing sexual selection to lead to very little trait divergence when sexual selection is very strong. And that's what we're seeing here. With weak sexual selection, we can get, maintain a lot of trait divergence because we're just at viability selection, migration balance. But when we have really strong sexual selection, we're able to maintain less and less preference divergence. Because you have less, sorry, less and less trait divergence. Because you have less and less trait divergence, you have weaker indirect selection bringing the preferences up. So we get less and less preference divergence. It's a bit of a feedback loop, if that makes sense. So both of them sort of collapse. So what ends up happening here is um, sexual selection is not doing what we thought it would do. It's actually decreasing trait differentiation. Um, but let's say, sexual, let's say you have super, super strong preferences, so everyone's only going to mate with males that they prefer. Um, in each population, you then expect from these results to get 50% red and 50% blue, with 50% preference for red and 50% preference for blue. But if Females with a preference for red have very strong preferences and only mate with red males. And females with a preference for blue have very strong preferences and only mate with blue males. And maybe you have two species, and who cares that they're shuffled equally among the two islands? So it becomes important then to ask, well, what will happen if preference strength can evolve? Like, can we maintain that situation with just two preferences and two traits, where the traits aren't really matching what's locally adapted, but at least they're both there? Um, so to look at what preference strength can evolve, um, we actually just went in and introduced one more locus. So um, that's a locus for the strength of alpha. And what we did is we assumed that the alpha we were considering this whole time um, was coded for by one allele there we're calling A1. So that alpha we could call alpha 1. And we're then introducing the possibility of a new mutation appearing 
for a new allele, A2, that codes for a different alpha-2, and that could be stronger or weaker than alpha-1. So let's say you had a mutation for a stronger alpha, or alpha-2 is stronger than our, our ancestral alpha, alpha-1. If that spreads, we can see that um, the strength of preference would evolve, right? If that's lost, the strength of preference wouldn't evolve. And we can again look whether, uh, whether your preference is evolving to be stronger or is evolving to be weaker, just whether we're introducing a stronger alpha or a weaker alpha than the one that's already there. So what happens when we do that, I'm going to show you the same graph, is we find that the preference strength just evolves downward until you get random mating. So if we started at that situation where we had really strong preferences, and they weren't shuffled right, right? We kind of, they were 50-50 in each area, so they weren't locally adapted. The traits weren't locally adapted. We actually will get evolution of weaker and weaker preferences until they're mating randomly. Um, they'd be pretty differentiated because at random mating, you have the most trait differentiation, but we can't attribute anything to sexual selection because sexual selection, number one, when it's present, is actually preventing differentiation, and number two, when you allow it to evolve, it evolves away. So no matter how you slice it, sexual selection is not really promoting speciation in this model. So to summarize what we found for our two questions, for trait and preference divergence, we found that because of the action of sexual selection, and with this model, we could actually go in there and dissect all of this out, um, stronger preferences actually lead to less trait divergence. And then when we allow preferences to evolve, we find that weaker and weaker preferences will evolve, removing sexual selection. OK, so this, um, this was one specific model. Um, it was an interesting one because it gave these counterintuitive results. And it didn't support this hypothesis that people um, have drawn from observations that seem to make a lot of sense, which was that sexual selection, um, it, sexually selected traits are matching um, big speciation radiations. So uh, there's actually a lot of different ways that sexual selection could perhaps promote or um, inhibit differentiation. The one I just addressed was kind of going down this red pathway here. This is a flowchart that Jenny and I actually created in a, a model, sorry, a review that we wrote last year. Um, there are other scenarios, though, that could be explored. I've done work on uh, this scenario over here. I'm not really expecting you to read all this. And I've done quite a lot of work on this scenario over here. Um, but the, the question is complicated. Biology is complicated. Preferences can work in different ways. I already told you about how geography can work in different ways. And it turns out that, ge that the geographical assumptions do affect the way sexual selection acts in certain ways. Um, the project that Jenny and I did actually is also on this chart. But before I show you that, um, what the project is, I actually want to back up to why um, this problem is so difficult in the first place. So uh, if you see the very top question here, it asks, are preferences under direct divergent selection? Let me just back up a second to get at what that's getting, um, talk about what that's getting at by reviewing what we just talked about. So um, in the model I just did, it was discrete, but you could also think of a continuous analog of it. So here we have a phenotype where population one has a certain optimum, so viability, if viability selection alone was acting, the po you might expect the population to be distributed like this because this is the most fit genotype in this environment that population one is in. And population two maybe has a different optimum. So again, if viability selection alone is acting, you might expect population two to be over here. So expect them to be pretty differentiated by viability selection alone. And the problem I was finding in the model I just talked about is that our, the preferences were sort of closer together in frequency in that model than the traits were. You can imagine the same thing if phenotype is your axis. So the preferences, um, in general, preferences tend to probably be closer together than traits. Uh, so when those preferences apply selection to the traits, they would drag the traits off of the viability selection optimum to something a little bit um, closer to each other than they would otherwise have been. Now, this all depends on the fact that these preferences are closer together than the traits, right? So if you could imagine that the preferences were somehow more divergent than the traits, then you would expect sexual selection to promote speciation because it would be dragging the traits further apart from each other than they are if there's viability selection alone. Now, the whole problem with speciation um, when there's gene flow is that it's very hard to imagine a scenario where your preferences are really pulled far apart unless you have um, 
direct selection on the preferences themselves that's divergent, and there are some scenarios where you could imagine that happening, but they're not likely to be completely general. They're likely to be fairly specific. So it would have to be that you're surviving better if you have a preference that's all the way over here in population one, and you're surviving better if you have a preference all the way over there in population two, and it's, it's kind of hard to envision. You're surviving better or you're just finding mates better in general. So um, what Jenny and I are looking at is actually inspired by a really clever solution that some people came up with, um, which I'll get into in a second, uh, for a, a way out of this dilemma. So this solution has to do with um, whether or not traits are condition dependent. And that's another jargony term. Biology is full of them. So I'm just going to um, explain this by starting by explaining the term condition dependent. So you, you consider a trait to be condition dependent um, or a trait uh, to reflect good genes in this following scenario. So let's say you have males that differ in genetic quality. So maybe it's um, vigor, maybe it's parasite resistance, maybe it's how many deleterious mutations they have, but they just differ in something fundamental about how good they are. And because I just said genetic quality, it's heritable, right? It's genetic. Um, and then you have to also imagine that genetic quality is honestly indicated by male ornamentation. So you would then call the male ornamentation condition dependent. So this means I can only, if I'm a peacock, I can only produce a fantastic looking train if I'm otherwise a great peacock, right? I just have really good genes. So if you think about maybe um, feather quality, if you're trying to produce really shiny, showy feathers, and you have no parasite resistance and your nest is full of mites because there's mites everywhere in nature, you might just not be able to produce that shiny showy train because your feathers are being degraded by these mites. But if you're a really um, healthy male, it's very uh, strong parasite resistance, you could, you could produce this, this color and this, um, you could be then favored by females because you look fantastic. Okay, so that's the idea of condition dependence. And what females are gaining when traits are condition dependent is they're gaining those great genes for their offspring, right? If you mate with a male that has fantastic parasite resistant genes, your offspring are gonna inherit those. Okay, so um, the idea that people came up with to relate this to speciation is that um, you might have condition dependent expression of a trait based on how well adapted you are to your environment, so based on local adaptation. So this is work by a bunch of people um, in the early 2000s. So what they supposed was, uh, let's say we have habitat A with some small seeds, and these small-billed birds um, are much um, better able to process these small seeds. They might then be able to produce this red coloration because they're in great health and high nutrition. Um, in habitat B, there's bigger seeds, and maybe these big-billed birds can process them, but the small-billed birds can't. And so then it's the big-billed birds that can produce the red coloration. So if you're to evolve a preference for red in the population, um, what they found is that that can then cause a initially normally distributed population for bill shape to break into two populations, one with smaller bills and one with larger bills. So this is generation time on the x-axis, and this is what's called a bifurcation point. So you have an initially normally distributed population. This is the, the phenotype here. It goes along until your preference for red evolves to be strong enough. That's not actually shown. The preference for red isn't shown in your figure, but it's evolving as we go here. When it gets strong enough, we get this bifurcation where we get a large build population and a small build population. So the really clever thing about this mechanism is we don't need preference divergence because all we need is for females to just um, evolve to prefer red, and red is going to indicate whether or not you have the right bill in each population. So that's great. It's a clever mechanism. I think it's pretty cool, but there's a problem with it, which is that all females prefer red by this assumption. That's good because you don't need preference differentiation, but it's bad because that's not what we see in nature. So we don't see um, individuals of closely related species all having the same showy character. We, show them having, we see them having different showy characters. And furthermore, we see preferences for population-specific characters in each population. So if you took females that are preferring this train and you put them in a population that didn't have it, well, so maybe this, these guys, they wouldn't prefer this crest. They just would be confused <laughs> because they don't have, there's no train around. They're looking for the train, right? So you actually do find specific, um, specific, specific preferences for specific traits. 
So Jenny and I are um, trying to extend this idea of condition dependence, unfortunately probably not um, in a way that would take advantage of the fact that it removes a need for preference differentiation, but we're trying to um, come up with another way that this idea could still promote speciation, the idea of having um, condition dependence and looking at how this reads, we can't call this context-dependent condition dependence because that's a <laughs> mouthful. But the idea is that you might have um, whether a trait is condition dependent and important for females in a certain population might depend on the population's context. So in environment one, I've drawn seeds that are red. So it's um, red seeds contain carotenoids in nature and females that can eat red seeds and process them can sequester the carotenoids, sorry males that eat the red seeds and process them, can sequester the carotenoids and develop red, very red plumage. And so it's a, often a sign that a male is a good forager for um, seeds like this if they have red coloration. So maybe in population one, females should prefer red males because these males are very good foragers for these types of seeds. But in environment two, maybe there are no red seeds. So red would be meaningless in environment two. Maybe what matters in environment two is the size of the prey and larger birds are better able to process larger prey, and smaller birds can't process as large prey. So females really should, in environment two, prefer large males, because that's really the sign of who's healthy and who's kind of better adapted to the environment. So um, this is where we're starting. We sort of got a, a model underway, and um, maybe in two weeks, Jenny can tell you the results, <laughs> or maybe not. Um, okay, and with that, I'd just like to thank my collaborators and some funding sources, and thank you for your attention, and I'll take questions. <laughs>